So when we're dealing with CPAP, some of the things that we can look for to understand that CPAP is actually working, um, the respiratory rate is going to increase. All right, it's going to feel better um, if they're, especially if it's extremely low. However, if the patient's breathing 40 times a minute and you put, place them on CPAP, the response that we're looking for is for that rate to actually decrease because a decrease in the rate can indicate that the positive response to the CPAP. If the respiratory rate is decreasing, with a decline in the mental status and it could be an indication that the patient could be getting worse and we may need to take them off the CPAP and put them back on a BVM device. As far as the heart rate is concerned, the patient's oxygen levels can improve with CPAP. The heart rate will typically decrease because the, ho the heart's not having to work so hard. Um, with the heart not having to work so hard to get oxygen, it can settle down a little bit and the rate will drop. However, if the heart rate increases, then it could be that there's a rise in uh, pressure inside the cavity due to an overinflation of the lungs, causing a decreased pump failure. So we might want to consider discontinuing it if that happens and apply BVM ventilations. <clears throat> now, some of the worst things that can happen if this is the wrong kind of patient, somehow the patient declines and we don't pick up on it, or if the patient tends to get worse, um, it could cause a pneumothorax, which is a portion of one of the lobes of the lung uh, deflates, uh, gastric distension, which means something's going on with the epiglottis, causing it to slam shut, too much pressure in the airway, causing all that positive pressure to be pushed into the belly. Um, they could puke. Um, the respiratory rate could get worse and they could progress into respiratory failure. Uh, their mental status could change and they could simply just have an extreme intolerance of the device. Uh, we do not do BiPAP in the field due to the fact that it is a machine that actually has PEEP and different kinds of uh, levels that are set so the respiratory therapist in the hospital can determine whether this patient can be weaned off of the machine or not. Overventilation can cause cardiac arrest um, when the spontaneously breathing patient is overventilated where the rate and volume delivered with the ventilation exceed the recommended rate and volume, the large amounts of air can become trapped in the alveoli causing pressure in the chest to remain extremely high. The overinflated air sacs can cause the capillaries in the lungs to become compressed and obstruct blood to the left atrium. And then of course when you obstruct blood to the heart, heart starts for oxygen, it will go into a dysrhythmia and then you can actually arrest. Um, so this would reduce the blood volume that is available to the left ventricle causing reduction in cardiac output. So some people with a stoma, that's another device that you may encounter in the field. Um, during a tracheostomy, a stoma is created by cutting through the skin into the trachea to relieve an obstruction higher in the trachea or to serve in place of an endotracheal tube. Um, that has been placed for several days. Um, sometimes the tracheostomy tube is a curved hollow tube that's usually made of rubber or plastic or metal of some sort and is inserted into the stoma to help keep it open. Um, with a laryngectomy, all parts of the patient's larynx have been removed. In a total laryngectomy, there's no longer any connection of the trachea to the mouth and nose, so the trachea has been disconnected from the pharynx um, and connected to the stoma in the neck. This alters the airway so that the patient breathes completely through that stoma. They no longer breathe through their mouth and their nose. In a partial laryngectomy though, some of the trachea connection to the mouth and nose remain and the patient can get some air movement through the stoma and some through the mouth and the nose. Stomas look like this. Um, they're extremely hollow right there. And you can see in the next slide, um, this is a larynx has been removed, so there's no vocal cords whatsoever. So this whole portion is missing, which means no air can come in or out of the mouth. No air movement, no voice box, no sound. So these patients here will wear some sort of an external digital voice box that produces sound that allows them to talk. Now in a partial laryngectomy, you can still move air in and out of the nose, possibly even the mouth. Still, possibly, the larynx has been modified so you can produce sound over the vocal cords and make some sort of noise. Um, and these patients will usually have to apply pressure to the stoma to allow full movement of air across the vocal cords. Um, the good thing about tracheostomies is that the connection piece to the BVM right here matches the fitting here. So you can take this, take the trachea or the the tracheostomy 
piece out, take the cannula off, and then this BVM, all BVMs carry a 15 by 22 millimeter um, adapter that sits right here, and then the BVMs can connect to them universally. So pretty much your patient's already intubated, so you don't have to worry about trying to manage an airway or tube this patient or put in a king airway because simply just remove the cannula, put the BVM on top, and you've got an intubated patient already. Um, sometimes they do get clogged, so we do have to suction these. Um, just basically head tilt chin lift, see if we can remove the obstruction, and sterile, sterile catheters are used to be able to suction the stomas to make sure, and the tracheas to make sure that everything is good and flowing nice. Sometimes the cannulas will get clogged. Uh, infants and children, you're going to place their head in a neutral position, avoid excessive volumes and pressures. Um, the BVM uh, with 450 to 500 milliliters of volume and usually without a pop-off valve. The head should be placed as um, far as immature development of the airways. You can cause hyperextension and can produce actually an airway obstruction if that head tilt chin lift isn't done correctly. Um, it is necessary to avoid excessive ventilation and volumes and pressures um, with these infants because it can lead to gastric distension, which is a big common problem with ventilating infants and children because we tend to get a little excited and bag too hard and too fast. Be sure the chest rises with each ventilation at a rate of about 12 to 20 a minute or once every 3 to 5 seconds. Patients with facial injuries, um, because of the smaller in proportion, um, the faces can swell, causing airway problems. Uh, use of an adjunct will be needed. You want to avoid an NPA with any mid-face trauma in infants and children. And then bleeding into the ferrets can actually cause severe and cause problems with airway management. Frequent or constant suctioning will be necessary. So be sure that you have a suction machine constantly available uh, with these patients to get rid of the copious amounts of blood. Uh, signs of severe partial airway occlusion or obstruction, uh, cough that becomes silent, strider, or an increase in labored breathing. And if they are responsive and choking, but effective, but is effectively moving air when they're inhaling and exhaling, just have them take a deep breath and see if you can get them to cough. That forceful cough can actually relieve the obstruction. Um, don't perform abdominal thrust. Don't, you know, go after the uh, foreign body airway obstruction. Um, if they're under a year of age and you can't really get them to cough, you can't really say, hey, little one-year-old, will you cough for me? Because it's not going to work. They're not going to understand what you're saying. Um, so these patients, you probably will need to perform abdominal thrust as you would for an adult patient. And an infant who's less than a year, add to those the five back blows and then the five abdominal thrusts to relieve that obstruction. It's always much easier to establish a tight seal with dentures that are in place. However, if they're loose or broken and they're floating around, they're going to cause a huge obstruction. So just remove them and uh, make sure that they're given to somebody that they can keep track of them because they're extremely expensive to replace. Uh, D cylinders, E cylinders, M cylinders, G cylinders, they all come with different uh, liters of air pressure that's inside of them. So you kind of need to know what we're dealing with to be sure when we're figuring out tank formulas, especially if um, you're going to work for a convalescent service or a service that transports over long distances, like say from Greenville to the Atlanta Burn Center. Um, you are going to have to know these cylinder constants so you can calculate, do I have enough oxygen to be able to take my patient from Greenville to Atlanta, Georgia and back if necessary. The last thing you want to do is not have the efficient or the right amount of oxygen on your truck and then run out halfway there and you're bagging your patient all the way to the hospital because you ran out of oxygen. So make sure you learn these formula, or at least learn this formula and kind of get a good familiarization with the different sizes and the different cylinder constants for each size tank. And we'll go over the formulas and kind of go over some examples probably in a discussion board. Um, and then also in lab, if you have questions on that, please bring those up as well. Um, oxygen in itself um, is not flammable. However, combustible materials such as oil and grease, um, they can actually catch fire and then the oxygen feeds the flame causing it to burn hotter, which in thus can cause an explosion. So oil, 
under and oxygen under pressure will explode if they come in contact. So this includes any kind of petroleum-based adhesives or lubricants such as uh, petroleum or uh, jelly. Don't smoke around oxygen, of course, because it superheats the source and it can actually cause massive burns or flare-ups. Um, make sure they're stored in a good temperature, about 125 degrees Fahrenheit or less, nothing hotter than that. Make sure all valves are closed, keep oxygen cylinders secure so they don't flop around and they don't fall over and break the stem to the tank. Um, under high pressure, these tanks can become actually quite dangerous. As far as pressure regulators go, um, they basically regulate anywhere from 0 0.5 to 25 liters a minute on how much oxygen you're going to give your patient. So your order dose, say, would be 15 liters non-rebreather. You would turn your um, regulator to 15. Um, and again, during the course of your lab, we'll go over these regulators and we'll teach you guys how to use them and how to apply them to a tank correctly. As far as oxygen humidifiers go, these aren't the ones you think about in nursing homes. They look similar to this, and we do carry some of these on the truck. You basically hook the sterile water up to the oxygen source, and then your oxygen tubing hooks to the humidifier bottle here and bubbles through the sterile water, kind of moistening the oxygen to tend to keep the nasal passages moist and they don't dry, crack, and bleed. Um, too much oxygen can worsen conditions such as a stroke or an acute coronary syndrome. So we have to think about as far as um, patients should only receive oxygen um, for the simple fact that they need to hypoxia or dyspnea. Um, it can actually cause a massive release of free radicals in the system, which can actually cause more tissue damage, cause a stroke, or an MI to get worse. All right, so always start with a nasal cannula with these kinds of patients. Just keep in mind that oxygen is a medication, okay? Oxygen administration, so if we have less than 94, we're kind of under dyspnea or some mild distress. So with conditions such as an ischemic stroke, acute coronary syndrome, and even post-resuscitation from cardiac arrest that make too much oxygen available, in the arterial blood can actually increase the damage to the tissue once reperfusion of the ischemic area is achieved due to the free radical release. So patients with uh, acute coronary syndromes who are exhibiting evidence of hypoxia or hypoxemia, you might want to have a complaint of dyspnea such as heart failure. Have an SpO2 less than 94 should probably receive some supplemental oxygen, but just be cautious about how much you're giving. As far as in these cases go, a nasal cannula, not a non-rebreather, might be your best way to go, um, especially starting with a liter flow of two, kind of titrate to the response to see what are my numbers, what are my sats, what's my patient's skin color, temperature, condition, um, and do I still need it, actually. Okay, if I take my patient off the oxygen and I'm maintaining a good sat of, say, 95, and my patient's warm, pink, and dry, and denying any respiratory problems, you might want to consider taking them off the oxygen for that reason. Um, cardiac or respiratory arrest, um, SATs less than 94, signs of hypoxia, patient becomes restless. Um, if they exhibit any evidence of hypoxia, the patient has an SpO2 under 94%. They seem cool, pale, diaphoretic, or any kind of signs of heart failure, suspected shock. Um, medical conditions that warrant it, such as COPD, emphysema, asthma, um, anything as far as older patients go, patients that are pregnant, greater than 20 weeks gestation, if they're having any kind of an issue, in order to provide oxygen to the baby, you have to give oxygen to the mom. So keep that in mind also. Um, high concentrations of oxygen in the blood decrease coronary artery blood flow and can increase coronary artery resistance in patients with cardiac disease. Um, so patients with reperfusion conditions, such as a stroke or coronary syndrome, um, can increase the free radicals, which we discussed before, um, which can lead to oxygen toxicity, which is a rare event, especially in the pre-hospital setting, but you never know. It can always happen. So just keep that in mind. Also, when we go through this stuff and you're deciding how to treat your patient, um, also too much oxygen as far as infants and kids can actually cause damage to the retina um, of the eye through scar tissue formation, uh, which can occur in premature newborns with too much oxygen administration. All right, so it can cause retinopathy um, of prematurity. Um, this is not usually a major consideration as far as the pre-hospital environment goes. This is more like a NICU-PICU kind of thing. 
and oxygen can never be withheld from any infant that needs oxygen. So just give it to them if they need it. Just keep in mind it's a rare occurrence in the pre-hospital environment, but just a little, little voice in the back of your head just say this should be something that we should keep an eye on just to make sure. Um, okay. Biggest thing is to make sure we're given the right device, the right amount of leader flow. Make sure we're attaching everything, and we'll go over this whole process as far as how to put together the regulator, how to attach it to the oxygen tank, and then how to hook up nasal cannulas and non-rebreathers and BVMs to that regulator and administer the correct flow rate per the regulator. And we'll show you guys how to do that in lab. <clears throat> Just a quick run through. Basically, the oxygen tank has a seal. Inside this seal right here, this little orange spot, this little round spot, there's going to be an O-ring. You need to make sure you keep that O-ring because it's extremely important. Um, and you'll see why. Righty tidy, lefty loosey to the oxygen tank. We're going to clear the debris and dirt out of that hole right there. Okay. Then you're going to assemble the regulator. It only goes on one way. Tighten it. Then we're going to check the pressure. Tighten it on. Check the pressure. And then you're going to listen around this area for leaks making sure that we don't have any leakage of oxygen. All right, then you're going to simply attach your nasal cannula, non-rebreather, or BVM to this port right here. Okay, and then the other end, go here, and we'll show you guys how to attach the non-rebreather to make sure it gets inflated correctly. Simply place over your patient's face, attach it firmly. All right, and then when you're taking the mask off from the patient, make sure that you turn... Um, the oxygen off, turn off the main valve because just turning off the regulator, the oxygen can still seep out a little bit. Um, you are carry a portable OxyCaddy on your truck, which usually is in a blue bag, and that is an e-cylinder, and inside that bag is all your other various devices that we use in the field that allows you to administer oxygen to your patient in the house. Um, however, once we get into the truck, there is an onboard um, oxygen supply system with an M cylinder that sits on the outside of the truck. My advice to you is to turn off your E cylinder, switch them over to the M cylinder in the truck, just to kind of preserve that E cylinder so you can have it for the next patient and the next patient. And then reattach the patient to oxygen if they need it for transport into the hospital. Patients usually sit, there's various sizes, there's an adult and a pediatric non-rebreather, so just be sure that you're using the appropriate size. And the purpose of the non-rebreather, as you can see here, is showing that the oxygen fills the reservoir bag at the bottom of the mask, okay? And then these have seals. As the patient breathes in, okay, these seals slam shut, occluding the mask, all right, and then they pull oxygen from the bag. As the patient exhales, okay, that pushes air out of these vents back out into the air. They take their next deep breath. These seals slam closed. They suck in air from the bag, which is 100% oxygen. And this way it prevents them from rebreathing their CO2 that they're exhaling, which is why it's called a non-rebreather. A nasal cannula is from one to six liter flow only. So these are for your mild distress patients that say I'm a little bit short of breath. They have good skin color. Perfusion's not that bad, but they need some air. So these are the patients like your coronary, uh, acute coronary syndrome and your stroke patients might want to start them at two liters nasal cannula, see how they do, and then kind of titrate to effect and maybe increase it a little bit at a time just to make sure that you're delivering the right amount. Simply the prongs go in their nose, just like you see here, then it goes over their ears, and then you tighten it under their neck. A simple face mask is similar to a non-rebreather, only the fact that it can deliver only 60% oxygen, depending on the patient's tidal volume. Okay, The exhaled air exits through the holes on either side of the mask, and then the oxygen flow rate is usually set at about 10 liters a minute, but must not be less than six. So basically your nasal cannula is one liter to six liters. Your simple face mask is six liters to 10 liters, okay? Your non-rebreather is 10 to 15 liters, and then your BVMs get turned up to 15 to 25 liters. So you're kind of stair-stepping. Simple face mask looks like this, all right? Partial rebreather looks like this. Then you have your Venturi mask, which is rarely used these days, so you probably won't see many of these. 
And basically we need to think without an open airway or adequate ventilation, patients are going to rapidly deteriorate and eventually they are going to die. Um, so airway is one of the most important things that we can deal with for the patient and we have to be sure that we stay on top of that. O oxygen therapy is used to reduce and eliminate and try to prevent hypoxia and just to be sure that the patient is okay. Assessment of this airway occurs early in your patient contact, like the first time that you encounter that patient. You need to be sure that as an example, a patient can have an open airway but ineffective ventilation. So no obstructions, nothing causing air to go in and out, but something's blocking it from being ineffective. A closed airway is opened using either head tilt chin lift or a draw thrust. Oxygen can be delivered through the ventilation device of your choosing depending on how the patient's condition is. You just have to be aware that the special circumstances or patient's conditions that can provide challenges such as patients with a stoma or tracheostomy tubes, infants or children, facial injuries, foreign body airway and dental appliances that we're picking the right device for the right intervention and for the right patient care.